Hello to everyone who is logging on right now. We're going to get started momentarily. Just waiting for everybody to get into the webinar. Hello, everybody. We're just going to give this another few seconds for everybody to get online. We're seeing the, the uh, clicker go up. I don't know if uh, all the attendees can see that, but we are uh, up to about 300 people on the webinar. Uh, we had about 600 registrations, so we're just going to wait for everybody to be able to get in, and then we'll try to get started. Good morning, everyone. Uh, coming to you from Bethesda, Maryland. My name is Ken Levinson. I'm the executive director of WIDA. I know some people are still logging in, so this uh, uh, apologies uh, for those of you who have to repeat myself. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, we're glad to be with you all today virtually. Uh, normally, those of you who know WIDA know that we do live in-person events, which we obviously can't do these days. So we're going to try to replicate those kind of discussions in this webinar today. Uh, we hope to have ones in the future as well to address some of the timely issues uh, that we're facing uh, these days. Um, if you have any trouble with your connection, um, and I'm already seeing one person who just pinged us that they're having trouble hearing, we're also broadcasting this on our YouTube stream, um, so you can try to watch the event there. I apologize if you're not able to hear something. Hopefully, um, it's, it, your connection will uh, improve. Um, af uh, we have a terrific group of panelists today. I'll introduce them momentarily. Um, after the panelists make their remarks, uh, we'll try to answer some of the audience questions. You'll see on your uh, Zoom interface at the bottom of your screen, there's a box that says Q&A. Uh, we hope you'll use that um, to be able to ask questions to the panel. We'll review those and try to go uh, through as many as we can uh, during uh, the webinar today. Um, you may know that WIDA had previously announced a four-part series of events looking at the WTO at 25 that we are co-hosting with the Asia Society Policy Institute. We still plan to try to do those events when we're able to, uh, but with all our attentions now turned to how nations, governments, communities, individuals can cope with the coronavirus, we wanted to hone in on how trade policy can help uh, countries cope with this global pandemic. And we're delighted today to be joined by an amazing panel of trade policy makers to discuss ways that trade uh, policy can help uh, move forward with a bold and meaningful initiatives working through the World Trade Organization and other fora. Um, you should have all received an email around 1030 this morning Eastern time with today's agenda and speaker biographies, but I'll give you a brief run through right now of today's webinar. We're going to start today with my co-host in our WTO series, Wendy Cutler. Wendy's Vice President of the Asia Society Policy Institute and Managing Director of their Washington DC office. I'm sure most of you know that Wendy spent nearly three decades as one of America's leading trade negotiators at the Office of the US Trade Representative. Most recently in her last role, she served as Acting Deputy USTR, where she helped lead US efforts to negotiate the Trans-Pacific Partnership, 
including bilateral negotiations with Japan. And she was also America's chief negotiator to the US-Korea Free Trade Agreement. Recently, Wendy wrote an article titled, Coronavirus, the Need to Adjust and Reshape Our Trade Agenda that actually inspired today's event. After Wendy Speaks, we're honored to be joined by a dear friend and mentor of mine, Ambassador Alan Wolf, the Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization. Those of us in Washington have known Alan as one of America's leading trade lawyers and thinkers on international trade in private legal practice as the Chairman of the National Foreign Trade Council and as the United States Deputy Special Representative for Trade Negotiations in the Carter Administration. We're thrilled Alan can join us here today from Geneva. And after Alan, we'll hear from Simon Evanet, a professor of international trade and economic development at the University of St. Galen in Switzerland. Uh, uh, Simon is also co-director of the Center for Economic Policy Research Program on International Trade and Regional Economics. Simon's written extensively in recent weeks on how trade policy uh, can be deployed to help deal with this global crisis, including his most recent paper, Trade Tackling COVID-19 Together. Uh, which helped uh, frame will help frame today's discussion. After we hear from Simon, we're pleased to be joined by an old friend, another old friend, Trevor Gunn, Vice President of International Relations for Medtronic, the world's largest medical technology company. As we'll hear a lot today, the availability availability of medical technologies is one of the most critical issues we face today, and we're delighted that Trevor can make the time to join us. Uh, and was an incredibly busy and difficult time for the whole sector. And lastly, we'll hear from uh, Susanna Fisher, who is currently the trade branch, uh, at the trade branch of the Embassy of Australia in Washington and is also a board member of WIDA. Thanks, Suze, for joining us. Uh, Suze brings to the discussion today years of experience as a trade negotiator for the government of Australia, including work on the TPP, but also the WTO's Information Technology Agreement, which may be a model for possible plurilateral agreement on trade and medical technologies. Uh, Suze wanted me to remind folks that she's speaking in her personal capacity today rather than on behalf of the Australian government. After Suze's remarks and discussion among the panel on this call, uh, we'll turn uh, to questions and I'll come back and lead. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend, Wendy. You'll need to unmute your line, Wendy. Well, thanks so much, Ken, and really thanks to all our viewers for joining us. And I know speaking for Ken, we're hoping that you and your families are doing as well as you can during these trying times and staying healthy. Um, this morning, we're gonna focus on the global trade community's response and contribution, not only to the fight against the coronavirus pandemic, but also to the economic recovery of the world with a special focus on what role the WTO can and should play. As Ken mentioned, early last week, I published a blog basically saying that we're going to need to adjust our trade agenda. It's not business as normal. Even though that was early last week, it sounds like a long time ago. Um, and in that piece, I made some concrete recommendations, including that the WTO call an emergency meeting, albeit virtual, to discuss and take action against the proliferation of export restrictions on medical supplies and equipment. I also suggested that in the medium term, the um, WTO should initiate sectoral negotiations to promote free trade in the medical healthcare sector. And finally, I suggested um, for the G20, but for the WTO as well, that all parties agree to a standstill in any new trade restrictive measures. Um, to be honest, I was not alone um, in, in, um, in, in um, putting forward these ideas. And many of my colleagues and other trade experts all around the world put out similar ideas and some put out additional ideas and useful steps that should be taken. The urgency of concerted action on the trade front has become even more pronounced in recent days. And I just want to highlight some key developments since Monday. Um, earlier this week, Director General Azevedo urged WTO members to provide the WTO information on trade and trade related measures they're taking in response to the virus. I'm sure Alan Wolf will talk a bit more about this. Yesterday, um, seven medium-sized countries led by New Zealand and Singapore issued a joint ministerial statement 
um, underscoring their commitment to keep supply chains open, to keep the trade lines open, and urging restraint in um, putting in place any trade restrictive measures. At the same time, we're continuing to see additional countries impose export restrictions, um, and that includes eight more in the past 48 hours. And we're grateful to our panelists, Simon Evanet, who will talk more about these restrictions for keeping us up to date. There are also reports coming out that certain countries now are imposing export restrictions on food exports, including Vietnam and Kazakhstan. And just about 10 minutes before um, this um, um, video conference has started, we just um, received a copy um, that's posted of the G20 leaders call, which also touches upon the need to keep markets open, keep supply chains open, um, and keep medical equipment and food um, um, supplies moving. And let's just say this week isn't over yet. It's here in the US, it's just Thursday morning. But in light of these developments, I think it's fair to say there's an emerging recognition around the world that trade initiatives are critical to address the pandemic and stem a global economic recession. And these initiatives should focus again on supply chains, trade restrictions, keeping ports, airports, and other trade lines operational, and including trade measures as part of a positive agenda towards an economic recovery. But it's unclear if the WTO, G7, and G20, um, the organizations that were so instrumental in 2007 during the global financial crisis, are up to these challenges today, particularly at a time when there's a vacuum in leadership and the US and China are at odds on so many issues. This morning, and let me just um, put forward some questions and then just some, then we'll get to our panelists. We're gonna explore these developments and challenges and specifically focus on what can countries do to stem the tide of proliferating export restrictions? How can countries work together to keep supply chains open and trade flowing? It's one thing to say we need to do that, but how is that gonna be implemented? Is it realistic for countries to unilaterally now eliminate their tariffs and other import restrictions in order to get better access to medical equipment and supplies? Is a standstill on new measures viable? And really the central question, what role can and should the WTO play in all of this recognizing that its relevancy and effectiveness were, were already being called into question before the pandemic. And as Ken said, we couldn't have a better panel to discuss all of these issues. And so to, now I'm going to turn to our first panelist, Alan Wolf, of the, of the deputy, one of the deputy director generals of the WTO, and just ask Alan, how is the WTO functioning now? Um, the face-to-face -face meetings are suspended. And what steps is the WTO taking to help members respond to the coronavirus crisis? Over to you, Alan. Uh, figured out how to use this. Uh, good to be with you uh, uh, from Geneva today. Uh, there are six things I want to point out with respect to what the WTO can and should do uh, at this stage and what we are doing. Uh, the first priority, of course, was to safeguard uh, the health of our uh, members, our staff, uh, and uh, the public. And uh, that began 16 days ago when the WTO suspended all meetings, uh, and that suspension was extended through uh, the end of April. Um, we'll see what happens uh, as we approach that date. Uh, all meetings in person, I should say. Uh, and then 12 days ago, WTO informed all its staff that uh, they were to work at home unless they had to be uh, in the building, which is largely the IT staff and the health task force uh, and some administrative people, but everyone is working from home. And it's been working very well, actually. Uh, this, this, it's busier now than, than it had been before the coronavirus. The second thing is to provide a framework for where members can uh, craft responses, individual responses, uh, the framework of agreements, and uh, which give a lot of flexibility. Uh, 
and a venue in which to uh, discuss what should be done next. Uh, the Director General uh, Azevedo participated in the G20 leaders uh, call this morning and uh, is going to be following up in communications with the G20. Uh, third priority is to inform members of the effects of the um, on world trade of the spread of the virus. I mean, Simon does a great job. Uh, we're doing what we can internally with a, a 30 person cross divisional task force to gather all possible information, not just on the restrictions, but on the, um, the trade facilitating measures that are being taken. So we can provide that basis of information uh, to our members. Uh, as you mentioned, Wendy, the Director General yesterday called for uh, increased notifications. He did that in a web broadcast, which is available on our website. There's a now a COVID-19 webpage uh, to uh, post information. The uh, trade forecast for 2020 is due to come out in a couple of weeks. And uh, the thing to focus on is the increase in trade costs uh, of getting something from a factory or farm in one country across an international border to another country. Uh, the trade costs have gone up by a multiple of existing tariff rates. Uh, so it's not just the visible tariffs that you see, it is the fact that uh, air cargo on passenger jets, of course, has been uh, cut back dramatically as the passenger flights have been cut back. The people who conduct trade are not able to cross borders anymore freely. That's ended. Uh, and uh, uncoordinated differential measures uh, with differing standards will cause uh, also a lot of difficulty in trade and medical equipment and uh, in supplies and pharmaceuticals. Uh, fourth priority is to make it clearly understood there's wide freedom under the WTO agreements to take emergency action, uh, to take necessary positive actions. They're not to be unnecessarily protectionist, and uh, that's a test that will be applied. Uh, but every member is free to lower its tariff rates autonomously. No problem at all, just do it. Uh, and some are, on medical equipment. Uh, WTO rules provide uh, plenty of room for uh, taking health and safety uh, precautions uh, through trade measures. Uh, the, uh, there's no reason under the WTO why there can't be a rollback of uh, export restrictions. WTO rules on uh, domestic subsidies uh, certainly allow for uh, uh, medical products and other things that are in short supply now or maybe in short supply to be subsidized. So this, and uh, under TRIPS, the Trade Related Intellectual Property Agreement, there's flexibility uh, for making greater availability of uh, medications, pharmaceuticals. Um, so there's plenty of leeway for countries to take the steps that are needed. You mentioned, Wendy, and it's the fifth thing I would mention, Yesterday, the initiative of uh, Singapore uh, and Australia, Canada, Chile, Brunei, New Zealand, uh, and Singapore to um, uh, pledge to keep their borders open, keep trade flowing. And that is, has been circulated within uh, Geneva to the ambassadors. Uh, and they will, uh, uh, they're thinking about what they want to do to uh, to uh, increase their, um, the pledges that uh, are being taken by a number of countries. Uh, important questions and suggestions have been put by you, Wendy, as you mentioned, and uh, by Simon, and Jennifer Hillman of the Council on Foreign Relations, Annabel Gonzalez at Peterson Institute. Uh, these have been widely circulated uh, and in Geneva among the ambassadors who represent uh, 164 members we have here and uh, they're considering what additional steps uh, they can take. Uh, the regular work of the WTO uh, has to continue, uh, and it's going to be continuing uh, remotely in many instances. So, uh, for example, um, uh, the uh, agricultural, agricultural notifications uh, will be done online increasingly. And that was already started before the corona uh, virus came along, and, and that's accelerated enormously. Uh, these uh, specific trade concerns uh, 
uh, from uh, uh, is going to uh, are going to be done online for standards. Uh, so, uh, and you know, there's been some discussion uh, among members because they had to do this for how do we reschedule another um, uh, ministerial meeting? Ministerial meetings are to us this like the Tokyo Olympics to us at the WTO, like the Tokyo Olympics was to Tokyo. Uh, it's a major event and it pushes countries to come to conclusions on negotiations. It's a forum in which environmental issues can be raised uh, on the side. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it'll be a forum where, uh, and there are major plans underway, there were major plans underway to raise these things in, um, in North Sultan. So, uh, we've got to get that settled so that uh, we keep the negotiation pressure on for things like fishery subsidies and for e-commerce. And uh, we uh, have uh, uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, move forward on uh, matters related to the environment, related to the empowerment of women, related to uh, giving greater access to uh, world trade by medium and small enterprise. I'll, I'll hold on there. I just say that uh, uh, there was a major effort and it worked in 2008 with respect to the financial crisis. This is different, it's deeper. It's, uh, if you look at the unemployment uh, claims in the US uh, that just came out, uh, uh, this, this is gonna stress uh, the world economy and it's gonna strain government's resources. And uh, I think that uh, we'll be equal to it, uh, but we're in very early days, and and uh, but we're making progress. I look forward to the remarks of others. Thank you, Alan. Um, I think you gave us a great overview of what the WTO is doing, and also just reminding us that the WTO really doesn't put any restrictions on countries unilaterally doing liberalizing trade now, and take um, um, and we should keep that in mind as well. Um, now I'm going to turn to Simon Evanet, who um, has done an incredible job in tracking trade restrictions during the virus um, and um, has really was the first one to just bring to everyone's attention the proliferating export restrictions on medical supplies and equipment. Um, so over to you, Simon, and I'm hoping you can share with us some of your work. I understand you might have good news with respect to some countries not only restricting trade but deciding to liberalize trade during the pandemic um, and welcome any of your kind of policy suggestions um, on what steps could be taken. Thank you Wendy and it's a great pleasure to uh, join this webinar. I'm going to make five uh, short remarks about the changing trade policy treatment of medical supplies during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The first remark is that we have indeed seen a proliferation of export curbs on medical supplies. These export curbs have taken a number of different forms. Some are de facto uh, uh, bans, others are uh, much more de, uh, de jure. Uh, but in total, the Global Trade Alert team has found the following. Since the beginning of this year, we have seen 63 different uh, bans imposed on medical supplies and medicines. We have seen 48 bans imposed since the beginning of March, which gives you a sense of the acceleration. And even further than that, we've seen eight bans imposed in the last 48 hours. So this is an area where events are moving very, very quickly. A total of 57 nations are implicated in these uh, bans that I've referred to. So that's the first point. So indeed, this, this issue is live. I will come back to the apparent logic of these bans later. The second point I'd like to make is that we are seeing some countries shipping medical supplies where there was either a formal ban in the past or a sort of de facto ban. We have seen shipments from China, Korea, and uh, Taiwan. And you know, this, is, this is welcome but we haven't seen any formal removals of the export bans where they have been put in place by those countries. And this, of course, must create uncertainty for traders and the like. There's another point there, which is, of course, the fact that these countries are now exporting again tells us that not every country goes through this 
uh, the peak phase of the pandemic at the same time. And we need to bear this in mind because there appears to be listening to the, the rhetoric of some politicians, this view that everybody is in the same boat at exactly the same point in time. And in fact, uh, we should be aware that for many pieces of medical supply, there are dozens of potential serious exporters out there. And so security of supply concerns have probably been exaggerated. The third point I'd like uh, to make is that we are seeing, especially in the past 24 hours, an expansion of these export bans from medical supplies into the area of food. And Wendy, you've already referred to the uh, bans by Kazakhstan uh, and I think Ukraine, um, we should add Russia to that list as well. So this is a worrying development. And also Vietnam has uh, limited the exports of rice temporarily as well. So I, we have to worry that this, uh, this phenomenon is spreading. The fourth point I would make, and this is the good news, uh, we have also found in the last uh, uh, week or so that there are 20 countries which have liberalized unilaterally the uh, importation of medical supplies and other products which are related to COVID-19. And six of them are in Latin America. And of the 20 liberalizations, 13 involve tariff elimination and seven involve relaxing non-tariff measures. So we are seeing countries um, beginning to liberalize the trade in this area. This is, of course, welcome. The idea of taxing um, imported medical supplies and soap at a time like this uh, seems absolutely perverse and counterproductive. And countries are indeed using the flexibilities available to them uh, at the WTO to be able to do that. So that's the fourth point and perhaps the good news. Now, looking forward, what can we do well, I think the first point to make is at the unilateral level, uh, clearly now that a number of countries have shown that liberalization is possible, uh, the, you know, the often uh, sort of uh, worldly wise dismissal of oh, countries never liberalize in situations like this, this is just factually wrong. We should put that option on the table and it should be uh, something that ministers should be forced to consider. The second uh, point to make is that with respect to export bans on or export curbs, I think this is a trade policy response, but it's not a trade policy problem that it's fixing. If we can remember the key problem here is that because of COVID-19, demand for medical supplies is accelerating far ahead of domestic production. And what we need to do is to narrow those gaps to fill in that supply, whether the supply comes domestically or from abroad doesn't matter. So the initiative and the energy of policymakers should be thinking about how to ramp up production now and keep it high for the next few months until this uh, pandemic is over. What an export curb does at the moment is just grab whatever is on the market and often, by the way, discourages local firms from ramping up production in the future since because they've lost their export markets. The revenue hit is quite significant. So I think the history of export restraints shows that they're often very counterproductive. They're a short-term measure, which I'm afraid in this case, people's lives, will, people will pay the price with their lives for this uh, particular bad piece of trade policy. More constructively, I think what we need is, and we're beginning to see this, I hope a bottom-up approach um, a, a, a between nations in trying to, to uh, tackle the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, at least as far as the trade policy contribution of it is concerned. We have no time for a global negotiation at this point. Uh, so instead, I think the types of uh, initiatives that we've seen with groups of countries coming together, with uh, led by New Zealand and uh, Singapore, is, is, is one approach. But the other approach could well be to identify guiding principles for trade policy during this era, and then our countries could sign up to them and uh, and, be, and verify that they have actually been following them. So I think we're going to see perhaps a ground up approach is probably the best way of trying to tackle this. For those of us uh, whose you know, careers started many moons ago, this sounds very different from the sort of overarching uh, accords and everything that uh, we'd love to see in the past, but there is no space for that, I think, at the moment, nor the time. So we're going to have to look for ground up initiatives uh, which essentially encourage country by country to start taking the right decisions. And given that some countries are uh, liberalizing and issuing uh, ex export curbs, then I think uh, we have enough good examples to point to as well. Maybe I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Wendy. Well, thank you, Simon. In, in this, um, during these times, any good news is, is welcome.
and maybe this is information we all need to do do a better job about getting this information out that countries are unilater unilaterally liberalizing and hopefully others will follow. Um, let me turn to Trevor Gunn from Medtronic, which is the world's largest medical technology manufacturer. And I, I hope you can share with us kind of what Medtronic is, is, is experiencing now. Obviously, you're ramping up production. You have a lot of demand from all parts of the world. Um, and so we'd be interested in hearing from you um, on that but also your insights into what can governments do now to be helpful and what um, what measures from the government are the least helpful now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And, and, and I think my, my remarks as one company are come very consistent with what uh, both Alan and Simon have said before. But uh, first of all, thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Ken. Timely topic. Um, uh, you know, it just reminds me every morning, if you follow a publication like Inside U.S. Trade, you look at the type of stories that they're putting in uh, every day. Uh, now it's just literally every single story in Inside U.S. Trade in terms of the headlines is all around uh, the, these, uh, these type of barriers that you've been discussing. Um, a, a quick note on Medtronic, we are the largest, uh, just to give you a sense, in the medical technology space. I'll tell you quickly well, who we are and who we're not. Um, you know, we produce uh, in total 131,000 different technologies uh, at this present moment. Um, we are also the largest producer of all the technologies in the respiratory illness space across the entire spectrum. Um, we are not the largest producer, though we do produce some of ventilators, though some may think that we're the largest producer of ventilators. That's not the case. Um, so quickly, I have four points. Um, one is the cry for education. Um, uh, uh, for our sector. But number two, I want to talk about procurement, uh, procurement needs and standards. Uh, three, I do want to address, uh, you know, one company's view, probably reflective of other companies uh, around the protectionist measures that have been talked about. And then four, I uh, want to talk about uh, uh, something much more positive called a thousand ideas bloom. Um, and uh, we'll come back to that in a second here. So, I mean, we're, we're you know, you ba if you look at the medical technology space, just to be very clear, you have three big segments where medical technology plays. We've heard a lot about PPE and the need for PPE. That's one and critical. That's all about avoidance uh, of exposure. Then you have the diagnostic space in the middle. And then you have the medical technology, advanced medical technology space. And we're only active really on, on that, the most serious pieces of that. And then we're joined by other great companies in this space like GE, Philips, uh, yesterday, we for the first time, I hosted a meeting together with the Development Finance Corporation of the nine largest ventilator manufacturers uh, in the world. It, it's not often that we meet together, uh, but we we pull that together uh, with them. Um, first of all, uh, and this is about the need for education. Uh, respiratory illness is very poorly understood. Uh, the, the different severity it really means going for a lot of people saying, "I don't know." Go back to the high school physiology to really understand the disease progression, exactly what, what takes out. Because if you don't understand the disease progression, you don't understand the nature of the disease, which is actually quite well understood. Uh, that is COVID-19 is not understood, but respiratory illness is very well understood. It's very difficult for you to understand how technology actually plays into different elements of that. Um, and, and so I would say that one of the, 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 major, uh, uh, the major issues that we have around the world is that everyone's made the whole thing into being you know, uh, about the ventilator. Uh, the ventilator is one technology. We, we produce, just as one manufacturer, uh, hundreds of technologies in that whole space from, from the, the least severe to the most severe. Some of the, some of the devices uh, are literally akin to open heart surgery. Uh, we see a lot less of that in the world, but uh, in, in, in very, very severe cases. Uh, uh, but so that's one very, very important thing. It's not only about the ventilator, it's about uh, the disease progression and all the technologies that in, are involved in that disease progression. And I would also say that in, in uh, the, this, uh, the greater simplification is around, it's not just about technology, it's about human capital. Uh, you have a lot of discussion around the frontline health workers about nursing teams to support. And if you think about not just the United States or developed economies, talk about emerging economies, that's an absolutely uh, critical, critical piece that often doesn't exist in any way, shape or form to actually support uh, those types of things. That's very, very important. Um, and then there's almost no discussion around the broader infrastructure. These are very sophisticated devices. These are, FDA classifies them as uh, class three devices. Those are very, very dangerous devices. Uh, but they, they needed a broader infrastructure. 
So, so there's just a lot of need for education here in the sector. And we've been doing seminars around what is a ventilator, <laughs> what is respiratory disease. We did some uh, uh, just about a week ago with all the major international organizations that I'm about to uh, bring into focus in my second point, um, which is around procurement needs and standards. I mean, if anybody could tell you today exactly what the nature of the disease is and exactly where it is today and exactly where it's going and at what rate, you know, life would be so much better, but that is not, um, uh, that is not so easy. Um, you know, it starts with epidemiology, uh, really, uh, and, and very few people understand the epidemiology of the disease. Thus, it's very, very difficult. But, but the point is around international organizations, you know, combining private and public sector efforts here to track the disease, where it's going tomorrow, uh, we can we can take uh, global demand needs uh, that we're getting from all around the world. It's something that we did actually with the nine companies yesterday to start to say, hey, we're, we're starting to hear from company XYZ in Latin America or uh, you know, different African countries, uh, South Africa, et cetera, that are starting to come on board. And then combining that with, with the competencies that the WHO, World Bank, uh, UNICEF, and other the major other agencies have. Um, so that's a positive picture. The, the, the negative picture is that every, every single one of these UN agencies um, and almost every single state in the United States and probably multiple different regions and countries are all competing out for themselves. So our call very, very simply is for uh, uh, broad, uh, applicable and transparent procurement standards as it goes, as it, as it applies to the entire spectrum of, of respiratory disease, following very, very strictly and, and clinically upon the, our, our present understanding of the disease, which is extremely, extremely important. We also think that there might be, we might call for one UN agency to really take a leadership role here, whereas you have multiple agencies all working on different standards. And this is at the multilateral level. Um, and that's providing uh, already what is an incredibly insane day, uh, you know, composed of 25 different phone calls from different governments around the world, some of them very, very emotional. Uh, you know, it, it, it takes that insane day and makes it um, unlivable. So we, we need that. We also need governments to think about how uh, we as a private sector, and not only Medtronic, but the private sector, you can think about allocations. We have uh, discussions here in the United States on that. Uh, other countries are thinking about that. Uh, think about, uh, and if people can, uh, you know, take uh, CDC-like thinking uh, and apply that to actual, to, to those actual allocations, it makes our lives potentially a lot easier. Our CEO called for that uh, on CNBC yesterday, if you've not uh, seen that interview. Um, then protections measures, you all have, 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 have done a fantastic job, but I just classified as people and product. I've heard a lot about product, but I haven't heard about people. And what's happening around the world in multiple countries in Asia, for example, is that you have uh, strict, uh, strict new rules that are happening relative to crossing borders. We understand that countries have sovereign rights to do that, and they're doing it really in their national interest, tends to be really in, in, in the interest of public health. We have no doubts around that. But what happens to us as manufacturers, um, and I, and I don't, don't, don't want to go into country names, is that you know one particular large country in Asia, we have 50% of the employees able to actually get to the plant that actually makes circuit boards to come into our ventilators. Not a good situation. Certainly about products, you guys have done a great job on that, and I'm not going to say anything more, but if I can give three examples. Um, we, Trevor, if I can just interrupt for one second, um, one more minute, and then we'll need to turn to the next sure. speaker and take some questions before we wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Just two, two examples, and then my final point. Uh, harnesses around pulse oximeters. Pulse oximeters are important for, uh, uh, very important for respiratory illness. Uh, one country stopped the export of those. We can't produce pulse oximeters, potentially, if that type of thing happens. We had a, that circuit board that goes into our ventilator, and we have only one production location for those ventilators um, that, from a particular Asian country. That Asian country understood it, put in an exception, and we were back, back, uh, back, back in production. Finally, let me end on, on, a, on a very positive point. A thousand ideas bloom. I don't think uh, we as a medical technology industry, uh, we that are often confused with the pharmaceutical industry, um, have ever had a time where we've collaborated with governments more in, in, in a mission critical sense. We've got literally thousands of ideas coming in from governments, entrepreneurs. Uh, we, our, you know, to be CEO had a, a discussion with Elon Musk, those type of things, so great ideas coming. We don't have any way to process all those ideas as quickly as they're coming at us. We think it's a wonderful moment. Uh, we, we have great uh, discussions going on with regulators in a way that I, I suggest that we probably don't normally have. Um, and uh, so we really think this is a, a creative time where a lot of those, uh, those, a lot of the barriers 
uh, some of them unnecessary uh, under normal conditions, um, would, would, uh, would is, is starting to make sense for us here. So happy to, to, to answer questions. Uh, sorry, I've gone over my minute, Wendy. Yeah. Thanks so much, Trevor. We really appreciate um, your perspective as someone doing business in this area in such a critical sector. If I can then turn to our last panelist, um, Susanna Fisher. Um, I know, Susanna, you're speaking for yourself, um, but I'm going to ask you a question as um, an embassy person from Australia. Australia is one of the seven countries that has signed up to this um, minister's statement. And I'm wondering if you can give us any more insight on that statement. Um, in the statement itself, in addition to again, calling for supply chains to be open, trade lines to be open, you know, no, no trade restrictions. It also welcomes other like-minded countries to join the initiative. And I think Simon was kind of calling that kind of a bottom-up approach. So can you give us your views on the initiative, where it might be going? And also, I'd be interested in your perspective about in the short term, do you think it's feasible for countries to unilaterally liberalize tariffs and do you see the need for maybe um, when we, once we get past this pandemic to embark on a, a sectoral negotiation so um, all trade restrictions in this sector would be either eliminated or minimized? Thank you. Thanks, Wendy, and good morning and, and g'day. And thanks so much for, for getting this conversation together and the innovative technology here. So on your first question about the statement, I think it's really important to contextualise that, that seven country statement. It followed on from a statement between New Zealand and Singapore of only a couple of days beforehand, and it was almost identical text and language. So we should possibly look at that as not necessarily the end of a process, but the start of one that is potentially iterative over time. The other thing I'd, I'd mention is that it's not necessarily the product of one particular group of countries or another. So it's not a product of the CPTPP, APEC or the G20. It is quite open and broad. So I think it's not, not the intention to see it within the sort of confines of processes that we've seen before in the past. On the next steps, it, this has moved at, at relatively lightning pace for any kind of trade initiative. So it's a little bit hard to say with, with any sort of definitive sense about what will happen next. But I would imagine that the group of countries is looking for ways to expand it. Um, it's hard to say from, from this distance what that, what that might look like, but I think with all the um, access that we have at the moment to things, whether it is through the G20 processes, through processes in Geneva, um, whether or not countries are meeting in APEC context or other groupings altogether, those all form kind of useful forums um, to be able to, to talk about the issue and potentially see an expansion in the future. Um, coming back to the, the kind of longer term question, um, or sorry, pardon me, that, that actual short term question first about whether or not it's realistic to see unilateral reductions. I think it's really dependent on two things. Firstly, there's got to be an inclination to do that. Um, and we've seen a mixture of reactions to the, to the crisis so far, and, and Simon's paper has done an excellent job of looking at both those restrictions that have been put in place, but also the, the liberalisation that, that's taken place as well. Um, in terms of the mechanics of it, I think it's really important to remember that um, some countries are able to do these kinds of actions relatively easily and quickly, and others aren't. And that's really dependent on whether or not you need an act of parliament or a, a vote of a legislature to see a change in the customs tariff at the border and things like that, or whether or not you've actually got kind of flexible regulatory mechanisms that can actually achieve a result in a far, far quicker outcome. Um, then coming back to this, this longer term question about um, whether or not we could, we could look at the WTO and, and potentially a plurilateral into the future as, as looking at reducing barriers. The two things um, I'd say about the reasons why that is a longer term objective is that we do need a critical mass. So at the moment, we've kind of got this bottom up approach, approach going, but for the WTO plurilateral context, that's not big enough quite yet. Um, we've needed that plurilateral, that sort of critical mass for WTO plurilaterals, really because they've been um, applied on an MFN basis. So that means that the benefits have extended to non-participating members, and that's created a free rider problem. And where we've got 
um, a critical mass of countries representing 80% and above, um, that free rider problem has been relatively small. So the good example there is the information technology agreement, which now of course represents um, around 90%, 97% of global trade. Um, the second challenge really comes from the complexity of the negotiations. And this is where, where the information technology agreement product expansion can be really helpful in, in informing future efforts. It does require that all the participating members agree on a single list of product codes and descriptions. Um, and that also needs to balance both ambition and sensitivities for those uh, participating members. So for medical supplies, we've got some help. The World Customs Organization has published its list, which was the basis of Simon's really great analytical work. Um, but as we both, as we, as we know, for, particularly if you're a tariff and trade data analyst, looking at that list, some of the classifications on that list are quite broad. So a good example there is one of the alcohol classifications, and that includes tequila, which is certainly one way of handling a pandemic. Um, but the classification also includes some kinds of industrial alcohols, which are useful for, for medical purposes. So any list really does need to be finally and, and tightly focused on the goods that are genuinely helpful for medical purposes. Industrial alcohol, yes, tequila, maybe not so much. Um, so there are ways and there are things that can be done to make negotiations go as quickly as possible. Um, and, and really, I, I want to just cover this really quickly because I know we want to get to a QA. and a um, Firstly, it actually really needs a good title to actually tightly define the targeted group of products that we're intending to reduce tariffs on. So if, are, we, are we trying to achieve something like a personal protective equipment agreement or something much broader like a medical supplies agreement? The broader it is, the longer it will take um, for negotiators to get through. Secondly, input from manufacturers and industry is really important for trade negotiators. The language of a lot of tariff classification work is very opaque. Um, you've got a lot of other, a lot of not elsewhere specified. So it's enormously helpful for negotiators to have information about the real world items that's included in, in those classifications. And that can actually turn tariff negotiators into advocates for products being included instead of being skeptics. So it is really important. Thirdly, um, the inclusion of customs classification officials. Um, the inclusion of these officials in these kinds of initiatives make sure that any lists and, and products that are actually included in them are described in a way that's useful and usable by customs authorities at the border after the agreement's entered into force. So that's really crucial for making sure that businesses can actually um, access and use um, the outcome of any agreement. So I might just finish up there because I, I know we've got um, Q&A to get to and, and pass it back to you. Well, thanks, Suze. And I think you really, um, I think have laid out some of the challenges um, for a broader negotiation um, in, you know, in the sector. But I, I personally think it's something that once again, once we're through this crisis, it's really critical for the WTO to really look and see if, if there is a, a path forward on that. And also, thanks for your insights on this, um, with this group of countries, um, you know, going ahead with their own bottom-up initiative. Um, given the late time, and I know there are a lot of questions coming from the, um, from the viewers, I'm gonna turn the program now over to Ken, who will be entertaining questions online um, from um, many of the viewers. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Wendy. Thanks to all of you for your uh, remarks. Um, we, I'm really pleased we've had a, we have a 440 people attending and we've had barely any drop off so I think uh, they were uh, pleased with all of your remarks or pleased to listen. My first qu question um, that we're going to read is from Jeannie Salo. Um, I think I'm going to turn this one to Wendy and Suze, maybe um, from your experience. Um, her question is, if countries are going to support a strategy to promote liberalization in response to COVID-19, what kind of leadership do we need to see? What countries need to lead? And um, how do we get that started? Wendy, Suze? I might um, try a, a, a quick answer to that one, um, which I, I, I think I partially covered in, in my comments about the critical mass. I think the, the key things at the moment are using 
whatever meetings are coming up and are available um, in this sort of socially distanced and virtual world um, to talk about the issues, um, to talk about what the intentions are, whether it's the seven countries that have joined on to, to what is a relatively short um, and, and very relatively easy to understand statement, um, really using the opportunities that are available right now, whether that's in um, through the WTO, G20, um, or other processes available to talk about the issues and, and encourage a conversation on it. And I would just add, um, you know, if you look back on some WTO negotiations, the IT1 negotiation got a real um, important push from APEC at that time. And so, um, you know, looking ahead, next year New Zealand is going to be chairing APEC. This might be something that they might you know, want to give some thought to on how what role APEC can play in pushing this ahead. But I couldn't agree more with Suze. You need to take, you know, advantage of meetings and, and be open to different coalitions of countries. But I would just also put on the table, I think in any future kind of sectoral negotiation along these lines, we all need to really give some hard thought as to whether the MFM principle works um, and whether or whether we really need to think about the benefits of the initiative just being shared among the participants. Thank, thank you for that. Um, Alan, I'm going to turn to you. Um, really pertinent question um, from Eva Hempel, which is as the WTO moves to hold uh, discussions and negotiations potentially virtually, are they going to be able to incorporate efforts from stakeholder? Uh, what kind of stakeholder engagement? Uh, efforts do you think the WTO can do? It's done a great job with that in recent years in its in-person sessions, but how are we going to be able to handle that in a virtual world, do you think? I think that's one of the things that has to be faced next. Uh, the, uh, the public forum has grown every year. Uh, last year we had 1,500 to 2,000 participants, uh, which uh, uh, sort of strained the, uh, the physical facilities. There were a lot more requests than could be entertained in terms of programs. Uh, in a virtual world, we don't face that constraint. And uh, we, that's something we're going to have to manage. I'd just like to underline one thing that was said earlier, and that is, uh, where does leadership come from? Uh, six joint initiatives were inaugurated at Buenos Aires two years ago, two and a half years ago. And uh, the uh, none of them came from, I think, the United States, the EU, uh, or China. They came from uh, other countries. So Australia, Japan, and Singapore started e-commerce, uh, and uh, the others joined. Uh, and each of the configurations is a little bit different. The, they're generally three quarters of the membership in terms of uh, accounting for global GDP. So they come in but they don't necessarily start it. That's why something like the seven, uh, it's, it's growing uh, dramatic, sort of like the coronavirus a little bit. Uh, it's growing. Uh, it was two, it's now seven. Uh, tomorrow it might be 15. Uh, so uh, I, uh, one other thing that um, uh, uh, Susanna said is the importance of input, uh, and Ava Hample mentioned. Uh, the uh, governments are motivated by uh, actually very much the private sector and by uh, civil society. And, uh, and their, their governments are what motivate the WTO. Uh, individual voices are not going to be uh, going to drive negotiations at the WTO. It's country voices, that are government voices that are going to drive negotiations. But that doesn't leave out the uh, private sector. Uh, and it would be great if uh, the 440 uh, participants in this call, uh, who are in the audience, uh, who demonstrated an interest in how coronavirus can be dealt with in, uh, effectively in trade policy, uh, to have their voices heard. So I, I urge them to do so. And thank WIDA for, uh, for sponsoring this along with the Asia uh, Policy Institute. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Alan, and, and glad to do it and glad to keep uh, this conversation going. Simon, I'm going to turn to you next. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions. Sherry Stevenson with one of them, uh, Grant Ernest, both asking about trade and services. Talked a lot about trade and goods on this call, um, but trade and services has been a growing area um, of attention uh, 
pre-coronavirus uh, discussions, but um, how do you see that uh, playing into this, uh, these potential discussions on, on trade liberalization? Uh, well, I mean, we have not, well, we have tracked, we've tried to track what has been going on in goods. I've been keeping an eye out for services. I think I found only one country which has liberalized um, trade in uh, services, actually in digital meeting services, which is exactly what we're enjoying now. I think it was one country from the Middle East uh, which uh, which openly liberalized Skype and all its, all its competitors as well. Um, but in terms of other areas, of course, services is a much broader uh, area. And of course, movement of medical personnel would be a natural uh, issue one could work or think about in this area here. And I think that's one thing we would have to track and see uh, much more systematically if that has changed. But it has not been um, flashing up on the radar screen that I have been uh, seeing in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but I, you know, I, I don't discount that things could be going on. Okay, uh, thank you uh, uh, for that, uh, Simon. I guess a follow-up question, Simon, is how do you see this uh, potentially reshaping global value chains going forward um, as we, we're in this crisis now, but what are the, some of the long-term impacts we might see on trade flows and global value chains after this crisis? So I think you're going to see two sets of impulses from companies, uh, the reconfiguration of their global supply chains to take account of what might be politely called location risk uh, is something which we're going to hear a lot more of. Um, and they'll also, I think, be uh, asking questions about just how many links do you want in a global supply chain, given that if any one of them breaks down, as was implied by, uh, I think, Trevor, uh, that uh, you could end up uh, finding that the ability to produce the final good is seriously compromised. So I think we're going to see an adjustment on the corporate side, and there's already been uh, quite a lot written about that. And of course, we're, we may well see an adjustment on the uh, policy side as well from governments, with, especially if some governments convince themselves uh, that they need to repatriate supply chains in the area of uh, uh, medical supplies or indeed in other areas. And of course, we have seen a resurgence of what might be called nationalistic industrial policy. And if that, uh, if that uh, continues to flourish, then I imagine there will be pressure on firms uh, to alter their supply chains, or at least strong incentives to repatriate, in which case I think we could see sort of policy-driven repatriation or, or policy-driven reconfiguration of supply chains too. I wouldn't rule either out. I think the direction of travel is pretty clear that supply chains are unlikely to be getting longer and uh, more uh, uh, some more global in coverage. If anything, they're more likely to become uh, more regional and shorter in uh, in distance travel. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Trevor, a couple questions have popped in for you. We're actually running out of time, so I'm going to pose them to you real quick. Uh, one coming in from Ambassador Robert Holliman. Um, you mentioned a UN agency potentially to lead on this. Uh, where where do you see that, and how is industry uh, making those recommendations? Um, the other thing had to do with what other medical devices are you hearing that um, people may be in need of? Or we've talked a lot about respirators, but also oxygen tank setups and, and the like. Right, thanks for that. And thanks, for, uh, Ambassador Holman, for that. I mean, I'm, I'm actually a big advocate of UNOPS. Um, it's not a well-known UN agency. Um, they're known, I would say, as the multilateral equivalent of the Army Corps of Engineers uh, uh, for, for, for any uh, for anybody, you know, on, on the call here. Uh, internally, I'm referring it to my, my team as wartime footing uh, and peacetime footing would be normal course of business. Uh, and, and we need an agency that, uh, you know, can uh, deal with hurricanes, natural disasters. Uh, in my view, UNOPS working in concert with the technical agencies like, uh, uh, of course, WHO, no question, uh, World Bank, uh, UNICEF, uh, all those are really in the lead there. But in my view, this is a moment for, for leadership of, uh, of that type, uh, personally there. Uh, uh, medical devices, yeah, and as I referred to at the, at the very outset, I mean, people make it out to be a, just about the respirators or just about the ventilators, but you've got hundreds of technologies in that whole space that enable the doctors to actually clinically deal with all the different levels of severity 
uh, of, of the onset of the disease as it attacks the respiratory system. So certainly oxygen, but I, again, uh, I not want to make it all about technology. Somebody talked about services. Remember the docs, remember the nurses, remember the frontline people I got to put together. Remember all those doctors that may be an orthopedic surgeon that may be in Italy asked to, to intubate, uh, right? Put, put, uh, put uh, oxygen down your nostril. That's not the way orthopedic surgeons are, are trained, but that may become necessary in, in how we need to prepare both the technology and, and human environment uh, uh, for uh, this marathon. Thank you, thanks Trevor. I think um, we're gonna wrap things up. I, we're actually at the bewitching hour, but I do have a closing question that might be a good note for us to end on. It actually comes, it's a counter question in a sense to the discussion we've been having coming from Lori Wallach. Um, Lori had a couple questions she posed in the chat, but I'm gonna focus in on one of them, which is, uh, this is again for Alan and Wendy, we're talking about uh, in this conversation what an ideal world might look like um, in a world of trade liberalization, but the reality is governments are moving in the other direction right now. Um, how do we deal with that immediate reality right now um, uh, Wendy, I know you had some recommendations about that in your paper, and Alan, I don't know if there's any closing your remarks you want to make um, about what we're seeing already on the global landscape and how maybe um, we can work with countries that are, are worried right now about their supply chains. Well, just, to, and I'll be brief, um, number one, I think countries, governments can agree it, at a minimum just to put a freeze or a standstill on any future trade restrictive measures um, and then work together to kind of unwind the ones that are in place. If countries are unwilling or unable um, to get rid of their restrictions, I think that certain principles can be agreed to to make them, for example, temporary, to make them, you know, um, flexible if other countries want an exception. So there are ways to kind of craft them to limit their impact. And I think that's one way to deal with existing measures. Over to Alan. Yeah, I say, uh, obviously, uh, I agree with uh, what Wendy has said, that uh, principles that would be broadly accepted uh, by uh, key countries uh, it would be very important. I think also education. Uh, there's been stressed by several of the speakers, namely, uh, if you listen to on YouTube to uh, Governor Cuomo's uh, plea for uh, release of the stockpile of ventilators for New York, because New York is facing a critical shortage now, but not every state in the United States is, is facing a critical shortage. If you listen to Arancha Gonzalez, interviewed by uh, Christian Amanpour, also CNN is on, uh, on YouTube, uh, the foreign minister of Spain pleading for NATO to uh, give assistance on supplies. Uh, this is a wartime effort and uh, it needs a flexible response. And I think education will help a lot. What Simon is doing, what this program is doing, uh, it will make a difference and uh, it'll play through. Uh, sanity will prevail. Thank you, Alan, for your uh, words of wisdom. I've, uh, you've been a mentor of mine and someone I've always looked to for a voice of sanity in the darkness. Um, and uh, we've been, you've been doing this a long time and, and I'm delighted to have had you join us. Wendy, Simon, uh, Suze, Trevor, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very sorry to, um, we had about 25 questions that were asked and we only got to a small handful of those. I'm sorry about that. We do, um, we will be able to review those questions afterwards. And if I can get some of those in front of our panelists, I will to hopefully be able to answer some more of those offline. Thanks very much to those of you who've been um, on the, uh, watching the webinar. Thanks again, as I said to our panelists, thanks to the WIDA team. Um, we are very sorry we can't have some of these events in person, but doing these events virtually uh, opens up some new doors for us to have people coming to us from Switzerland um, is something we haven't been able to do, uh, haven't done before in our live events, certainly at WIDA. Uh, so um, hopefully we can keep up the dialogue. As I mentioned, Asia Society and Policy Institute and WIDA are looking at doing a series of WTO events. I think we're learning that we should do more of these online. Um, we will do more of these webinars in the coming weeks, um, hopefully very soon, um, trying to address additional issues that are raised. Thank you all very much for joining us. With that, I'm gonna ask my colleague Diego Añez to
Uh, thanks for his help in setting this up. We're gonna be turning off the webinar now. Thank you to everybody for being here. Uh, please be in touch with WIDA. Let us know your thoughts about how this webinar went and what we can do in the future and some future topics that we might be able to address that would be helpful to you in your work and in your communities. Thanks everybody.